What I'd like to kind of shift toward now is how we use our comp philosophy to actually support the teamwork and the servant leadership. So that employee ownership model he created really set us up for a strong interdependence of faith. You can't uh, excuse yourself as a great independent contributor. It doesn't matter. If you don't bring a bunch of people with you, it doesn't matter how good you are individually, your outcomes are going to suffer. So we really have always operated under, it's teams of great people that make an even bigger impact. You can have a lot of good individuals, but if they don't do well as a team, you're not gonna perform very well overall as a business, which is bad for a company that's owned 100% by the people inside of it. So we set up a comp model that has a lot of what we call we comp, so it's a balance between the I comp and the we comp. So it looks a little bit like this, maybe you can't read it all, but it's more, so me the employee is on the right, me the individual is on the bottom, team is on the top, and the owner is on the other side. So we try to make sure we got things in each segment that helps to drive, you can do very well, better than others if you're a top performer, that's true. We don't want to deny that, we love that. We love to overpay the best performers. But we also want to make sure even them are tied back to the we compensation. So it's kind of funny if those of you who might have read any of E.O. E. Wilson's work, really fascinating. But really what it gets down to is bees, ants, termites, and people are the only ones that really collaborate. Um, so we, we often, a group in our company just last week started a new team and their logo is a bee with Buchanan plaid wings where they swarm problems together. So it's interesting, that's kind of how a number of people on our board of directors describe us, is we're more like bees, we swarm problems, we don't turn and run away from them. So um, it's interesting because I guess his research would say that we comp can work. So this is a Harvard Business Review article from March of uh, last year that really promoted the fact that you want to have reward systems that reward the behavior of group collaboration over the individual which is consistent in a lot of writing. Um, certainly Jim Collins, good to great, uh, reiterates that in a lot of ways. You can't build a great company when you're just a team of individuals trying to do things. You have to really build that environment so that collaboration happens. So the collective talent within the organization can really accomplish the bigger goals. That's the only thing an organization is good for, <laughs> is leveraging the internal capabilities and strengths of the team. So how critical that alignment could be. So the way we um, reward leaders is they have a huge portion of their compensation tied to the we compensation. So uh, the idea would be if things are slowing down in the team, the hourly team on the floor who's producing what we make, if their overtime goes down, the reality is our comp system automatically adjusts for leadership that they will take even a bigger haircut proportionally than the team on the floor. So we really try to make sure the systems serve that sharing the gain and sharing the pain. So we try to make sure we don't have those kind of leaders. Okay. So the, the comp model is about sharing the pain and sharing the gain and the leaders will share more in the pain. Conversely, when times are really good and things are running better, they're going to participate in the gain as well, but not disproportionately. So the next thing we did was a real quick, uh, I'll just cover it quickly, but we did a brand discovery, went out to customers, competitors, suppliers, community members, did a bunch of stuff and said, um, you know, you go talk to whoever you want, you have that feedback back to us, who do you think we are? And what, what they came back with is, in the circles off my slide here, but the everyday hero at the bottom of the slide is what they said about our team. And we really believe that is very uh, germane to our culture and plays back into some of the other things regarding what we think we can do in the marketplace. As somebody was mentioning earlier, everybody wants great customer service. Who, who wants to be the servant though to deliver that? And that's a challenge we have because it, it's not a natural thing for everybody to want to do that every day. But our team, the way they described them, were humble, everyday heroes. They would do amazing things and just simply act as though it's my job. That's just what I do. 
So pretty powerful. So we also got started with some uh, company-wide leadership development. So we grabbed all the leaders in the company, didn't matter at what level. If you had any people responsibilities, or even if you were on the uh, kind of the brink of getting people responsibilities, we'd bring you to these things. And this event was done by Ed Zajac, a professor at Northwestern, who's just a wonderful man and a guy on our board. And I'll quickly go through some of these things just to give you a sense of what we developed to. So it's about being a fiduciary. If you're a Scott Ford fiduciary, who is your beneficiary? Fellow employee owners, customers, suppliers. So we're trying to make sure the whole ecosystem, leaders know they're yours to serve. So we go through a lot of the things about um, how to explore yourself as a leader, um, what to work on, work on your empathy, uh, your, the things that you'll get back from that will make you not only a better leader but understand yourself better. So we talked about the challenge in that development and the reward for you is become a fiduciary, show empathy, gain wisdom, a lot of things that we're talking about today. And then the reward part is a more successful Scott Forge, which we're all in the interconnected fate, more collaborative team and a happier leader. Which again, if you're not creating leadership roles that people want to fill, it's going to be hard to sustain. But we did a, a survey, uh, we took it at a point in time that there was a lot of convergence of uh, bad economic news. Uh, a lot of our major markets were in recession and that kind of thing. And we wanted to take everybody's temperature at a point where we could really see how's the culture holding up. So we got some really good feedback. We made sure all the leaders understood what it was. We spent a lot of time with two different PhDs evaluating all the feedback. We cut it, parsed it, made sure we understand where the main leverage was. And then we went about um, working on it. Again, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip to what does working on it look like? Well, we took the feedback from the survey and we brought it back to um, le leadership because really every survey is a leadership survey and every survey is a comp survey. So we worked on comp and we worked on leadership. I won't go into the comp part for today, but the leadership. We were talking earlier about that conundrum between being a servant leadership and holding people accountable for results. We saw that very clearly and I think that's a very important challenge in uh, servant leadership. So we talked about it as the paradox. So it's very common to find organization with a culture that emphasizes both results and caring, and almost all of them fail at it. Because uh, it's confusing to employees. Are they expected to optimize individual goals, strive for outcomes at all costs, or should they uh, work as a team and emphasize collaboration and shared uh, success? The nature of the work itself, the strategy, structure, the organization, all those things can get in the way. And one of the things we found back to that paradox is what Adam Grant writes about in Give and Take, which is there's a very thin line between a giver and a doormat. So a lot of our leaders felt, like was talked about this morning, the difference between servitude and being a servant leader. We tried to really help them understand there's a big difference there. Very powerful. And it works well, and we got two great examples in Ron Hahn and John McGill right here. They pull it off every day, and we got a lot of leaders that do, but really hard for the new leaders to get it. So we partnered with a couple people to help us create great leadership development programs, and I'll kind of, in the interest of time, kind of skip through those. A lot of good reading. Um, we did a lot of sharing of materials and books, and then we brought in what we call one-on-ones, which basically every leader meets with everyone on their team, for 30 minutes every week. So one meeting, 30 minutes, besides all the other work interaction. And that meeting consists of 10 minutes for them, 10 minutes for the leader, and 10 minutes on their career goal, their development, that type of thing. So we're, we're about 50% through our implementation of this. We started top down. So Ron and I are doing them all first, and it's, a, it's turned out to be a great tool for us. It forces that one-on-one -on -one time. Um, as Mr. Pieper had been explaining, that empathetic listening, all those things that are key to servant leadership, we try to pack them into that half hour. There's nobody in the universe except the leader and that other person at that moment in time. And it's been a short time, but we're already seeing a reasonably profound difference. The employees love having a regular scheduled meeting on their calendars every week with their leader. We think that's going to make a big difference in some of those other issues. Just in closing, I want to just maybe point out in the implementation of these things, 
It's very, very difficult. I'll show in a slide here if you guys want the um, research done on this, but there's, it's really people interactions and a company's response to change that you're dealing with here when you're trying to shift the cultures. So this quadrant uh, example, you can see where caring is and where results are. They're in different quadrants. So it's hard to do both. Although as a business, you need to do both. Even as, a, um, as Hector was describing, a, 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 not a profit organization, but a nonprofit still has those same challenges. You still got to deliver. So I'll skip through these, but this is a little more detail on your people interactions and your response to change. But I think the people in this room can just appreciate how you're interacting and how you're responding to change is that daily conundrum, because it always happens. So this is, I think, a pretty interesting reality is leading with culture may be among the few sources of sustainable uh, competitive advantage left to companies today. Successful leaders will stop regarding culture with frustration and instead use it as a fundamental management tool. And I think that's absolutely true. Servant leadership, we feel, is a competitive advantage. We think that cultural stuff does end up put making us a much stronger company, a lot more resilient to those factors we talked about that will be in the environment for the next decade. We started this a while ago because we truly believe everybody always wants to work with good leaders. It's not just millennials who want to work with good leaders. So all the, thing that Mr., all the things Mr. Thibodeau and uh, Mr. Pieper have been doing, and we've only been exposed to them in a short time, are spot on for what it takes to be a good person and a good organization to really thrive in what's coming ahead. And it's just great to be in a room full of people uh, this morning and this afternoon who have a like-minded interest in exploring that. So I just real quick want to give credit to Dr. Sajak, who did a lot for us in the initial learning around some of these servant leadership skills. And this is the Leader's Guide to corp uh, Corporate Culture article in the Harvard Business Review where that grid was. So you guys can access it that way too. And thank you very much for your time and attention.